Okay, this is problem 3-66 on page 112. The bucket has a weight of 80 pounds and is being hoisted using three springs, each having an unstretched length of 1.5 feet and stiffness of 50 pounds per foot. Determine the vertical distance D from the rim to point A for equilibrium. Now, I'm not going to draw this problem. You'll have to look on in the book. If you don't have the book, Please look on with someone who has it or someone who's looking at the PDF online, okay? That way you can see the figure because what I'm going to do is just draw one triangle here. It is a right triangle. And you might guess that I put point A at the top and point C bottom right. And what this represents is a single spring between those points. It's symmetrical at 120 degrees around. So I thought that I could probably get away with just working on this one. Now here's the problem. This spring has some length, and let me call that length L. By the way, let me warn you. In this problem, I'm going to use a lot of symbols before I plug in any numbers. It's actually good practice for you to get used to doing that. Now a lot of times in statics, problems are easy enough and you use the geometry so often you don't really want to give a name to all the geometry and so you just plug in numbers. It's a bad habit that forms. And it'll really bite you in dynamics, so, and in other classes as well. So I'm trying to work some problems as well where I can use symbols. That's, I was probably, I probably forgot about the law of cosines. But one of the reasons I used x and y is to try and get some symbols in there, okay? What was it? Uh, math was fun until they threw the alphabet into it. <laughs> anyway, so we know that this spring is going to have some length. Now the more force there is in the spring, the longer that length is going to be, but without the fourth, the, the initial length is one and a half foot. So we know there's weight on it, so we know that L is going to be more than a foot and a half, right? We're sure of that, okay? Now we also know that the distance from here to here is one and a half feet. Do you see that? Does that mesh with what's in the, uh, the figure? Mm -hmm. What they really want us to find, though, is this height, D. That's really what we're looking for. That's the unknown that we've come to find. Now the spring constant, K, is 50 pounds force per foot as we read in the uh, text. Now I'm going to make a free body diagram that's maybe not perfect because it doesn't necessarily include all the forces in a clear way, but I think it'll make sense. For example, there must be tension on one side. So I'm looking at point A. There must be tension on point A. And there's a force pulling up here at 80 pounds. Now, I'm not going to use all 80 pounds. I'm going to use a third of it. Why? Because I only want to look at one spring, right? And I'm just assuming that all three springs take the force equally. Okay, so I know I'm just going to apply 80 thirds of a pound to this point A. Let me put point A down just a little bit, I guess, so you can see it. Now, there are two other forces acting, right? There's, there's two other tensions acting on A, and I really don't care about anything except for the horizontal component that's acting there. I, I don't care about them because notice I've already taken care of the, the vertical contribution from the other two by dividing this by three. You see that? So all I care about is the horizontal component of the tension of those other two. Now, exactly what it is, I don't know. Why did I write cosine of theta? Well, because they're not just horizontal, they're actually at an angle, right? So I, I'm not going to evaluate this, I really don't care about it. I'm just trying to represent that it's there and I recognize it and that it's necessary for equilibrium, okay? Now, what do I know about this tension force? Well, the tension is developed in the spring, isn't it? If there was no force at all, this spring would have a length of one and a half feet, but there must be some tension. So I'm just going to write it out as K times L minus L naught. In other words, this tells me how much the spring is stretched. The spring's initial length was L naught. If I subtract that from the current length of the spring, I don't know what it is, but that's okay. If I subtract it from the current length of the spring, that's how much the spring is deflected. Multiply that by the spring constant, that must be the force on the spring. Neglecting the spring weight and all those sorts of things. Okay? Now, the vertical component then of this tension, because that's really all I care about is the vertical component of it, right? The horizontal component, I'm not going to mess with TX, it would cancel, you know, with that. I'm not worried about it. So what I'm going to do 
is just look at the y component of this tension. And so that must be the tension itself, but look, we've got another geometry triangle here, don't we? Okay. As a matter of fact, we know that the length of this side is d, and the length of this side is l. This is the hypotenuse, so the geometry triangle is over here, the force triangle is over here, but they are similar triangles. So let me write this another way. Ty over T, vertical side over hypotenuse, has to be similar to the geometry triangle D over L. See that? That has to be true because they are similar triangles. So then I could write that Ty is T times D by L. Okay? Now why would I do that? Well, there's multiple reasons, but one thing I can do is substitute in k delta L for T. So in other words, Ty is actually equal to k L minus L naught times D divided by L. I'm going to put the L with the other L so that it makes some sense. Okay. Now, why would I do all of this? Well, it makes my life easy. Think about it. If I sum forces in the Y direction, I know that, uh, well, let's do it this way. Ty has to come out to 80 thirds pounds. It has to be, right? Because this spring provides a vertical component of this force of the total 80 pounds. It provides a third of it because it's one of three springs. Okay? So that number, by the way, just comes out to 12, or not 12, pardon me. 26.6 repeating pounds. So I actually know what Ty must be equal to. What else do I know? Don't I know K? I know the initial length. You know D. Do I know D? No, that's what we're looking for. Okay. We're asked to find D. Okay. But you're right in that there's a relationship between D and L because notice what we've got here is one equation and two unknowns, a D and an L. But there's another relationship between D and L that you've been learning since, I don't know, since you learned about right triangles. How does that relationship go? Forget the forces for a second. Look at the geometry. What's the relationship between D and L? A squared plus B squared plus C squared. Pythagorean's theorem. So just purely from the geometry, D squared plus 1.5 squared. Let me drop the feet for the time being. Obviously D and L are feet as well. That's true too, isn't it? Look at what I've got now. Two equations and two unknowns. And I can sum them in together and solve for this. So, let's see. So the way I chose to do this may not have been the best way. What I did was I took, uh, well that is an unknown D. I decided to solve for D in terms of the other, so L squared minus 1.5 squared, square root, would give us D. And so that way, over here, I could say, I'm going to need some more space. <laughs> Ty equals, let's start plugging in numbers now. Well, actually, better yet, let me, let me do it symbolically one more time. L minus L naught by L. D is root L squared minus 1.5 squared. Okay. Now, this may have ended up being a harder way to go because what I could have done was come up with direction unit vectors for all three of the springs, right? And then I could have summed the horizontal components, the vertical components, and the Z components as well, right? And that might have been an easier way, I don't know. But this is the way I went. Primarily this time I did make a conscious decision to go this way so that I could use symbols and get you used to that as well. Because I know the students always struggle with using, well, maybe you guys don't. <laughs> maybe the exception. My experience in the past 15 years has been the students struggle with symbolic equations. Plus, I wanted to show you a little trick that I think you're really going to like. Anyway, notice that all we've got now is L is an unknown. You might look at this and say, well, this is going to be a little bit of a problem, but I think I could square everything and get rid of that square root to try and put these L's together. But the problem is, you're going to end up with an equation of a form, a L squared plus B L plus c equals zero. That's going to be the form of the equation. It's not too bad. You know how to solve those. But would it be quite that simple? 
I think you actually also have an L cubed term. Why? See this L squared? Once we square both sides, we'll have an L squared term that ends up being multiplied by L. And that's going to be a little bit painful, and I'd like to avoid as much pain as possible, because I don't remember how to solve a third order equation. I do know how to use Excel, and you need to get used to using Excel as well. Okay? So, let me uh, show you a nice little trick. Maybe I don't feel like doing algebra today. Maybe I just want to use Excel. Could I use Excel to solve for L? Well, I know what the left-hand side of the equation needs to be. That's just a number. That's 26.6. If I were to guess an L, I could plug in for L and see if the right-hand side equals the left-hand side, couldn't I? And actually, you know what? I take that back. Maybe this would have ended up, I don't know. I was thinking maybe I could divide through by L, maybe we wouldn't have had third order. I didn't really feel like worrying about it, <laughs> honestly. I didn't even try, mainly because I wanted to show you goal C. But also, here's another problem. When you square an equation like this, you might actually introduce more solutions than actually exist. Because remember, when you take the square root of something, you, or, or when you square something, you can get there by a positive or a negative square, right? So by squaring, we could introduce more solutions that are not valid, and I wanted to avoid those as well. Anyway. So let's plug in all the numbers we know. 26.6 repeating equals 50. And I'm, I'm being consistent with my units, so I'm not going to bother writing them down. All lengths are in feet, all pound, or all forces are in pounds. The spring constant is pounds per foot, I think. Yeah, pounds per foot. So we're set. Anyway, so 50. In fact, what I did is I went ahead and moved the K to the other side. And then we've got basically, well, why I rearranged it, I don't know. To avoid confusing you, I will... Uh, I'll do this. So I divided L by L to get 1 minus L naught over L, and then root L squared minus 1.5 squared. Got to be careful, I need parentheses around that. Okay, so if I could plug in an L, I know the initial length, that's just a number, that's 1.5, then I could see if the right hand side equals the left hand side. And I could guess and check like this for a while and probably hone in on it. And Find out the answer. And then I don't have to work any algebra, do I? All right, minimal algebra. I don't have to worry about introducing other solutions that are not valid either. Now, I know this is off camera, but if you're watching this, I'm going to post a spreadsheet in Brightspace as well. Seems like I always get requests from people that I don't know on YouTube say, hey, would you mind to give us that spreadsheet? That sounds interesting. And most of the time I accommodate them, but... There we go. Your uh, TVs are uh, TVs are not on. Let's try turning the TVs on so you can see it. So, what I'm actually going to use is something called goal C. Every time I show students goal C for the first time, their mouths hang open for about five minutes. And why didn't anyone tell me about this? This is awesome. Well, I agree. That's why I'm telling you about it. I think it's pretty nice myself. You guys have seen me make plenty of mistakes, right? I make mistakes. Why not just use Excel to solve the problems from the very beginning and see what happens? Okay. So, what I like to do is put down a so-called right-hand side and a left-hand side. And then I like to <coughs> insert the variable L. Well, that's not what I wanted. There we go. Now, it doesn't look like a script L like I drew it up here, but you guys recognize cursive L's, right? <laughs> okay, good. I had to explain. almost thought I had to explain cursive. But anyway. So we could take a guess. How long do you think L would have to be? It better be more, more than a foot and a half. Guess two feet? Sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Let's just throw in two feet. Why not? Not 52 feet. That would be unreasonable. The right hand side, I know, has to come out to 26 point, a bunch of sixes, close enough, divided by 50, right? That's what the right, or I'm sorry, that's what the left hand side has to be. The right hand side had better be the same, and maybe I ought to. Uh, Organize these so that they make sense. So the left hand side is definitely that number. The right hand side had better be the same thing. Could we compute the right hand side? Sure. I've got a length that I've guessed. I could plug that length into this equation and find out if I guessed right. So let's do that. So let's say equals and what do we need? Let me show you how I set up equations in Excel. When I have multiple parentheses, it's a good habit to set up the parentheses you need first and then fill it in later. If you don't do that, what will happen is you'll end up, and 
you may not see it very well in this problem, but you'll end up with either too many or too few parentheses, and Excel will say, blah, <laughs> what do you mean by this? And most of the time it'll say, I think you mean this, and most of the time it's wrong. Okay? So it's better just to go ahead and say, you know what, I got two things that are going to be multiplied by each other. The first thing is going to be this 1 minus 1.5 over L. That's easy. I can do that. First one is 1 minus 1.5 over length L. Fine. What's the second one? Well, the second one is a square root. So a square root is the same thing as something in parentheses to the half power. Now, Excel does have the square root function. I never use it. I just take the uh, stuff in the parentheses and raise it to the 0 0.5 power because it's the same thing. Okay? Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. What goes inside the parentheses? Well, L squared minus 1.5 squared. All right, we can do that. So inside of here, L squared minus 1.5. Let's not forget to square. When I hit enter, do you think this right-hand side is going to come out to exactly what the left-hand side is? Unless I'm really lucky or copied down my solution, right? Let's find out. Nope. That's what always happens. They're not the same. In fact, you could define something you call error. The amount of error is the difference between the right-hand side and the left. I don't care which one you take first. It doesn't matter if the error is part of the negative. Non-zero error suggests that I'm off a little bit. Okay? So now what could I do? Well, I could guess. You think we guess too much or too little at two feet? Too little. Too little. Okay, so what number do you want me to put in? 2.25. 2.25. Well, now the error flipped, didn't it? We went past it. It was negative error before, now we went past it. So what should we guess next? 2.2. 2.2. And I went back. We could do this for quite a while. We could keep jumping back and forth, and since we, the, the sign of the error changed, the SIGN, we could certainly hone in on the number. Excel can do about a million of these in a heartbeat, though. Check this out. Data. What if analysis, goal seek. You might want to write this data down. Data, what if analysis, goal seek. Because I think you'll start using this because you're really going to like this. My goal is to set the error to zero, not to 10, <laughs> to zero, by changing the guess of L. You ready? Watch this. This is cool. Done. 2.222. It's not zero. Well, it's close enough. Is it? So, let me, let, me, let me do it again. Hang on. So, what if analysis, goal seek. Notice the error is 0 0.02. Think of that as two pennies. Okay? Two pennies is not a lot, but it's not good enough. So, I want to ch set, we're back to where we were because I canceled it. I want to set the error to zero by changing the guess of length. Now we're at uh, six ten thousandths, right? So a hundredth of a penny. Have we decreased the error significantly? Yeah. If I were to round off, well, you see the problem, or the number looks like it's rounded off to three decimal places. If I round it off to four, yeah, I might be able to drive it down a little bit. In fact, it kind of looks like the answer might be 2.222222. We did change signs, that's a little high. I mean, how much accuracy do we need? How much precision do we really need? All right, that's what the question becomes. Now, you probably aren't comfortable with this, and you say, well, it's not exactly zero, so I don't really like this. Well, okay, we can go through this way, too, if you like. We can solve for L. But a lot of times, it doesn't matter. In fact, a lot of times, when Excel iterates like this using gold seek, what you'll find is that you come out to an error that is very close to zero, like it'll have a, a, a number times 10 to the negative seventh or so of error. Okay, which is close enough as far as I'm concerned. Basically what the error says is that we're wrong in about the fourth decimal place, but notice this is the error here, not the error in L. It is not a measure of the error in L. Well, I guess in a way it is, but it's not, it's not necessarily proportional to There's a nonlinear relationship between the two. So if you have some algebra you really don't feel like solving, you can just gold seek it and it'll work. Okay? Any questions on this problem? I've got a question. Are we done? No. no. We want D. We just found L, didn't we? Not D. What I could have done was solved for uh, L in terms of D and plug that in to replace L, right? It would have been just about as bad to work with, but I could have done that. Okay, so when I solved this before, I think I came up with 
2.223 or so, which is pretty low also, error. So somewhere in that range. And so what I did was I simply plugged back into here. And I said, give me the square root of 2.223 squared minus 1.5 squared. Put that in my calculator and found that D is about 1.641 feet. That's it. So that's how far down it, that the, the lamp hangs due to the spring tension. Notice this is a nonlinear thing, right? We've got nonlinear terms, and that makes the solution a little bit more difficult. When you get to 320, MT 320, which is a thermodynamics class, I'll show you a piece of software by F chart called Ease. It's double E S. The play on making things easy, of course. And it is a nonlinear equation solver. And it'll spit this out in a heartbeat. Okay. Any questions on this problem? All right.